welcome to the Fantasy Baseball Cafe podcast. I'm your host, Josh Shepherdson. You can follow me on Twitter at bchat50. And today's podcast, we're going to look at the shortstop rankings. But before we get into that, let me uh, direct your attention to fantasybaseballcafe.com where we've got my rankings, Dolo's rankings, and some other great content such as team-by-team previews uh, and in power ranking form by Brad Johnson, as well as some uh, one-off articles, uh, including a couple closer pieces, one by Dolo's and one by myself. And uh, yesterday I posted a AL Sleepers and Breakouts article as well that, that I would highly suggest reading. There is a sleeper or breakout candidate from every American League team highlighted in that. So if you're prepping for your drafts, definitely where you want to be is uh, fantasybaseballcafe.com. And while you're there, check out the forums. There's a number of very avid fantasy baseball gamers on there ready to chat, offer insight, and uh, accept insight. So get on there, have some fun. But uh, without further ado, let's jump right into the shortstop rankings, which are headlined by Troy Tulowitzki. At this point, we know what Troy Tulowitzki is. He is the best hitter at his position, but he's also injury prone. He's received only, uh, he's received over 500 plate appearances only one time in the last three years, and he's played over 140 games uh, just once in the last four years. But he's also got over 20 homers in five of the last six years. Basically, when he's on the diamond, he is a force to be reckoned with. Shortstop is an offensively devoid position, and Troy Tulowitzki performs like a first baseman there, basically. So uh, even with the injury concerns, we're talking about a late first round, early second round pick, just due to the ridiculous offensive output he's going to put up when healthy. And the scary thing is, is if he does put together a 500 plus plate appearance season and does stay healthy, you're going to get return that's just on, on off the off the charts. But most likely, it's best to factor in a DL stint or two. It's it's the norm with Tulowitzki, but you're still going to get your production, and uh, he's easily the class of the position. Checking in second is a guy that's no longer going to carry shortstop eligibility after this season, most likely. But newest uh, Boston Red Sox, maybe not newest, but new Boston Red Sox, Hanley Ramirez checks in at second. Uh, His power was down last year. He only hit 13 home runs with the Dodgers in 512 plate appearances, but he was nicked out most of the year. A healthy uh, healthy Hanley is capable of uh, 20 home runs around about, and uh, he did steal 14 bases. He's a guy that should steal around a dozen this year, a little more than that. And he hits for average. I would expect him to hit for a 285 to 290 average. So you're basically getting the five category contributions from Hanley Ramirez. And uh, in a good year, maybe you get a little bit more power, uh, maybe a slightly more efficient stolen base rate. You could push upwards of 20 stolen bases. This guy can do it across the board. He is easily the second-ranked shortstop for me. The the biggest concern with him is usually health, much like Tulowitzki. But uh, Hanley Ramirez is a fantastic hitter and a very good lineup, so you're going to get some counting stats as well. Uh, Number three is Ian Desmond. Ian Desmond has gone uh, 20-20 in three straight years, uh, over 20-20 stolen bases and home runs. Uh, His batting average took a drop last year to 255, and that was due to an increased strikeout rate. But this is a guy that uh, that kind of power and speed is not something you can expect routinely at at most positions. I mean, you're talking about outfield type of numbers at shortstop, and uh, the upside for the batting average is somewhere in the 275, 280 range if, if he curbs that strikeout rate just a smidge. So this is a guy that, again, is also a potential five category contributor. Uh, He's going to be a little light probably in the run production categories compared to Hanley and Tulowitzki because he'll hit a little lower in his club's order. But the Nationals have a really loaded, deep lineup, so he should get some run production numbers, even hitting a little bit lower in the lineup than uh, the two guys ranked ahead of him. Fourth is old reliable Jose Reyes. He played in 143 games in 2014 after playing in less than 100 in 2013. He was healthy in 2012, so really it was a freak injury in 2013, an, an ankle injury sliding into second base. He's a guy that I would peg for over 140 games, and uh, he may miss a little bit of time here and there, but for the most part, he's not a guy that I would label as injury prone. He did steal 30 bases last year, hit nine home runs with a 287 average. Low K percentage is going to assure that you're going to get that average uh, around 285 or better. But 30 stolen bases are great. Uh, he was efficient. You should expect another around 30 stolen bases this year. 
uh, with with better health, if he plays closer to 160 games than the 143 that he played last year, he should reach the double digits in home runs again. And he's leading off for a fantastic Blue Jays lineup. So over 100 runs is definitely well within reach for him. Uh, fifth is Starlin Castro. You can go ahead and throw 2013 out the window. Uh, it looks like an aberration when you look at the rest of his uh, seasons in the big leagues at this point. He had 14 home runs, stole four bases, hit 292 last year. Uh, he's part of a revamped Cubs offense. It should be much improved. If he hits second for the club, which is, I think is where he will hit, um, then you've got yourself a, a second or leadoff, perhaps. You've got yourself a good source of runs scored. He should hit for a high average again uh, in the 290 range. Powers there. I, I wouldn't bank on stolen bases bouncing back to the double digits necessarily. He's got the speed to do it, but he's a very inefficient base stealer. And I... I I know Joe Madden likes to let his his uh, players run a little bit, but if Castro's getting thrown out on on half of his stolen base attempts, that that red light's going to go up real quick. So he's got a chance to approach double digits again, maybe ten to twelve stolen bases. But keep an eye on his efficiency before just penciling him in for that. Uh, six is Daniel Danny Santana, a guy that I have ranked higher than than my peers at Fantasy Pros, which I'll touch on a little bit later in the podcast. But in 430 plate appearances last year, he had seven homers. Stole 20 bases, hit 319, but he had a 405 Bay Pip. He did hit a lot of line drives. You'd expect some Bay Pip regression, so expect the average to go down a bit. But as I said, we'll talk about Danny Santana a little bit later. Uh, Alexi Ramirez ranked seventh for, for me. Uh, he played in 158 games in four straight years, basically. So he is a model of consistency for being out there. And that, that matters. I mean, if you can get a guy that's going to be out there performing at a fairly high rate and you don't have to worry about him going on the disabled list, that helps. I mean, that that's uh, helps immeasurably. Uh, he hit 15 home runs, stole 21 bases, and hit 273 last year. Stolen bases look legit. He stole 30 the year before. He's an efficient base stealer. The power's uh, outburst was a little bit surprising, but he does play in a good ballpark for, for home runs, so he could approach double digits again, but uh, he, he struggled with power the couple of years before that, so if he fails, uh, fails to hit 10 home runs this year, it shouldn't be a shocker, but you're going to get those stolen bases you should get a decent average, and uh, you're going to get a lot of games played. The counting stats might be a little bit light because he's probably going to hit down order for a re retooled White Sox lineup, but he should still get some decent run and RBI totals uh, compared to his, his shortstop peers. Johnny Peralta checks in eighth. Peralta had a fantastic first season with the Redbirds. Uh, he hit 21 home runs with a 263 batting average. His K rate dropped from the year before. But his BAPIP was uh, below his career mark, so that, that's part of the reason why he only hit 263. I expect him to give a couple home runs back, but uh, he'll probably make up for that by attacking on about 10 points onto his batting average. So overall, you've got a solid solid foundation uh, for Johnny Peralta's stats. Uh, he could hit in a favorable lineup slot for driving in runs, so that'll be a nice boost for Johnny Peralta's value. Uh, ninth is Ben Zobrist. 10 home runs, 10 stolen bases last year, 12 and 11 in 2013. Uh, should hit around 270. I'd expect something in the same home run and, and stolen base department, uh, another dozen, dozen maybe. Uh, he moves from one home run suppressing ballpark to another from, from Tampa to Oakland. So it's not like he uh, should get dinged too much for his park change. He should be in a decent lineup that should award him some run production numbers. And if you're in a league that counts on base percentage instead of or in addition to batting average, he's a guy that you're going to want to uh, want to roster. He, he walks a lot. He, he'd probably move up in front of Peralta, Ramirez, uh, Danny Santana, Santana, and uh, possibly even Starlin Castro for me in a league that uses OBP just because he's such a reliable source of, of walks and such a high uh, on-base percentage guy. Ten is Jimmy Rollins. He's he gets back to being your normal five by five category uh, shortstop. He moves from Citizens Bank Park to playing his home games with the Dodgers at, at Dodger Stadium. And uh, the first thought uh, for me was, well, what's going to happen to his home run total? Well, it shouldn't go down too much. The switch hitting Rollins is going to primarily bat left-handed because he's going to face more right-handed pitchers and lefties. And both ballparks have nearly identical uh, home run park factors for left-handed batters according to Stat Corner. So I wouldn't ding him too much. Uh, he, when he does bat right-handed and faces lefties, uh, the park factor for home runs drop is substantial, but we're talking about maybe a couple home runs. So he hit 17 last year. Pencil him in for 14 to 16 this year probably. 
Uh, he's an efficient base dealer. He stole 28 last year. He's a little bit older, so maybe knock a couple of those off. We'll say 25 stolen bases. He's never been a great source of batting average. We're talking about a 240 to 250 hitter. So still very good contributions at the position. I like Jimmy Rollins this year. He's one of the last reliable options uh, before things get a little bit murky. Uh, and speaking of things getting murky, we get to number 11, Xander Bogarts. Bogarts is very young. He's only 22 years old. Uh, he, he left his fantasy owners wanting more last season. But you have to remember, he's 21 years old in the big leagues. That, that's quite the steep challenge for a young player. Uh, he hit 12 home runs, 240 batting average with a 6.6% walk rate. 23.2% K rate, and just two stolen bases. I would expect as he settles in, you're going to see that K rate go down a little bit. He was a patient hitter in the minor, so that walk rate should go up a bit. He's going to grow into his power. So he's a guy that could easily add to that total uh, substantially this season, especially if the light goes on and he figures it out. I like the lineup that he's in. He might get some decent run production numbers, probably hitting down order for the Red Sox. But this is a guy that has the potential to uh, catapult into the top five at the position, but he is still young, 22 years old, struggled a little bit last year. So you can't bank on that just yet. But uh, Xander Bogarts is a guy that I like 11. He's a guy that I would feel comfortable drafting as a starter. I would want a backup plan, but uh, at number 11, he, he, he is a fair ranking for him when factoring in the upside. 12 is Eric Ibar. He's basically the opposite of Xander Bogarts. He's not a guy with a terribly high ceiling, but we do have a fairly high floor with him. Seven home runs, 16 stolen bases last year, 278 batting average. Should post a pretty similar line. Those numbers line up with his production in recent seasons. The really nice thing with the switch hitting eye bar is that he's going to hit second most of the time for the uh, Angels, or at least projects to. That's right in front of uh, a guy named Mike Trout. You might have heard of him. Right behind Mike uh, Cole Calhoun. And he's got also uh, Albert Pujols hitting fourth. So that's a that's a pretty cushy lineup spot when it comes to run scoring. Mike driving a few runs with a decent leadoff hitter on in front of him. So I like Eric Ibar. If you're looking for a safe, reliable shortstop, not really worried about chasing upside, Ibar is your guy. 13 is Elvis Andrews. Stole 27 bases last year, but was caught stealing 15 times. 2013, he stole 42 bases, was only caught stealing eight times. So basically, if you can cut that that cost stealing right down and get back to being the efficient base stealer he was in 2013 you might have something you're probably going to get 25 stolen bases or more anyways because that is speed is really what he brings to the table but with the new manager ron washington's not there anymore uh we don't really know what uh what, what's going to happen in terms of stolen base attempts so there is a little bit of uncertainty there uh, he's going to bring you no power and he's about 265 to 270 hitter so He's, he's on the fringe of the starters based on his speed, but that's what you're drafting him for. And uh, more on Andrews a little bit later. Alcides Escobar checks in 14th. He's going on average 45 picks after Andrews in NFBC leagues. And, and I would prefer Escobar. He's basically the same type of player. You're drafting him for his speed. Stole 31 bases last year with a 285 batting average. Highline drive rate should assure that he hits for a decent average again. Uh, 2013's poor average output looks uh, looks a little bit fluky given his, his batted ball profile and his, his typical uh, high high bay pips, which you're going to get with a speedy player like Escobar. The very efficient base stealer, so and Ed Yost is a guy that likes letting his guys run. So pencil him in for 28 plus stolen bases, probably going to push 30 again. Uh, decent average, maybe a little bit of a downturn in that. You'd be talking 275 instead of 285, but I, I think you'd take that if you're drafting him for speed. Uh, 15 is a, basically the wild card on this list. Jung Ho Kang. Jung Ho Kang uh, is 28 years old uh, in early April. So just, I believe the day after opening day, he turns 28 years old. Last year, he absolutely annihilated uh, the KBO, which is a Korean baseball, uh, their highest form of, of baseball over there. It's a very hitter-friendly league, so you do have to take these numbers with a grain of salt. It, it would be almost like looking at uh, Pacific Coast League AAA numbers, if you're looking for uh, a similar type of atmosphere. I can't say that it's exactly the same, but but that's the comp that I've seen most uh, thrown around. He had 356, 459, 739 with 40 home runs. He's struggling this spring. He's striking out. But you also have to remember that this is more than just a baseball transition. He's coming to a new country. He's, he's got a lot on his plate right now. He, he's not assured a starting position by any stretch. But it looks like he's probably going to be used in a utility form, uh, spelling Josh Harrison at third base, Jordy Mercer at shortstop, 
Neil Walker at second base. Maybe he gets a little bit of corner outfield time, but that 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 speculation on my part, as opposed to anything that I've I've read uh, in, set in stone. But he's a guy who, if it translates and if it clicks, he's not in the right ballpark for power, but a guy that might be capable of hitting 20 home runs at shortstop. That's a guy that you want to have on your radar. He's a guy that I'm going to gamble on, even even with the poor spring training numbers. I'm going to give him a bit of a pass. There are some questions about his viability as an everyday player, but. At this point, most likely you've already got a another starter there anyways, or you're going to be looking to double dip at the position and, and hit a, a safe pick anyway. So Kang's a guy that if I don't have a shortstop or I already have a shortstop and I have that, that bench flexibility or I'm looking for a middle infielder, I'm going, to, I'm going to swing for the fences with Kang because he's a guy who can clear the fences if everything goes right. 16th is as Drupal Cabrera. We, we touched on him a little bit yesterday on the podcast uh, discussing second baseman. He's what he is at this point. He's a 240 to 250 hitter. He's going to give you maybe a dozen stolen bases, dozen home runs. And uh, he, he should retain uh, second base and shortstop eligibility possibly um, going into next season. But as a non-keeper, that doesn't really matter. Uh, 17th is Chris Owings. Again, another guy we touched on on, on yesterday's podcast. But to uh, remind viewers, highline drive rate should, but but strikes out a bit, doesn't have great plate discipline. So the batting average uh, probably isn't going to be great. We're probably talking about a 260-ish hitter if things break right. But he is going to hit for some power. He's going to hit. Uh, he's going to steal some bases. He could outproduce a number of players in front of him in those categories. Just be aware that he's probably going to be prone to some hot and cold streaks due to his plate discipline issue. So if you're in a head-to-head league, there are some weeks where he's going to look great, and there are some weeks where he's really going to bring you down. But uh, in roto leagues where you're just caring about the final season totals, uh, you can deal with some of that volatility. Uh, checking in at 18th is Javier Baez, who according to an ES, uh, I believe it was a Chicago Tribune report yesterday, he has been assured that he's going to be on the opening day roster for the Cubs starting at second base. He has struggled this spring, uh, a lot of strikeouts. That's basically the uh, the book on Baez, big power, but big strikeout rate. Beware that he could struggle. It's good to hear that he's on the club, that he's been assured that he's going to be on the club, but it doesn't mean that he's going to stay on the club. If he continues to strike out, doesn't rein that in, it's going to undermine his power. The upside's uh, just exponential. I mean, this could be a guy that if it clicks for him this year, we could be talking about a first-round pick. Problem is, is there's a substantial downside. There's a downside of him getting optioned to AAA. It's not like the Cubs are short on options to uh, replace him if he does struggle. So beware if you do draft Baez. He's probably going to be overdrafted. But if you can get him with a late-ish round pick, uh, there's plenty of upside to justify that. 19th is Jed Lowry. Last year, he had six home runs with a 249 batting average. Uh, the year before, he had 15 home runs with a 290 average, though. I'd expect him to settle on somewhere in between. He moves to a more hitter-friendly ballpark in Houston uh, after playing a couple of years in Oakland. He was in Houston uh, in 2012, and he did hit 16 home runs and 387 plate appearances. So that kind of speaks to what kind of upside we're talking about with him. With full-time play, we could be talking about a guy that, that approaches 20 home runs in, uh, in over 600 plate appearances. I wouldn't exactly extrapolate that 16 home run, 387 plate appearance uh, pace over a full season, but 20 home runs is certainly not out of the question for Lowry. And I would expect his average to go up from the 249 mark from last year. J.J. Hardy checks in at 20th. Last year was down here. He only hit nine home runs, 268 batting average, but he hit over 20 home runs in the seasons from 2011 through 2013. So he does have a track record for more power. I'd expect that to bounce back. Maybe he doesn't get to 20 home runs again, but if he doesn't hit in the upper teens in the home run mark, I'd be kind of surprised. Uh, batting average, that's about right, probably 260 to 270. Uh, if he does swing for the fences a little bit more and uh, airs it out, Maybe you see that average dip into the high 250s, but if he's hitting a few more home runs, you take that trade off. 21st is Gene Segura. Segura had a very disappointing follow-up to a big 2013 campaign in which he stole 44 bases with 12 homers and a 294 average. Last year, he only hit five homers, 20 stolen bases, 246 batting average. He's not as bad as he was in 2014. He's not as good as he was in 2013. Look for something in the middle. I would actually say probably slant a little bit closer to last year's production since that looks a little bit more like his rookie season. Probably should hit for some more average. He did hit for average in the minors. I don't know as though I believe he's going to approach that 12 home run mark again. Uh, maybe six to eight. 
Our stolen bases is gonna have to be a little bit more efficient, but if he gets on base more, he could approach 30. Problem is, I'm not so sure that Segura is a, a great hitter. Uh, there's definitely upside if you draft him at 21st, but it, I'm, I'm not completely sold that he's not closer to the 2014 hitter uh, than, than the guy that we saw in 2014. So he falls outside the top 20 shortstops for me. There is some upside there. If you draft him as a middle infielder, that is the ideal situation uh, because he could potentially emerge as a very good starting shortstop option, or he could be a cuttable person uh, as the season wears on if he just doesn't produce. Andrupton Simmons checks in at 22nd. He's having a very hot spring. Uh, excellent contact rates. Just seven home runs last year, 17 home runs in 2013. He, he's a year older, uh, more physically mature. 17, making a run of 17 home runs again is not out of the question. Batting average could go up if he improves his contact. Uh, the type of contact he makes, biggest problem with him, he hits a lot of infield fly balls. He did cut down on that rate last year. If he can cut down on that again, then uh, we've got a guy who could actually be a sneaky late round selection as a lottery pick. So I do like Andrelton Simmons. Uh, I think that there's some upside there. So keep an eye on him. Consider him a strong middle infield option with the uh, potential to emerge as a starting shortstop by season's end. Brandon Crawford checks in at 23rd. Not a very exciting person. Now this is, this is where it gets a little bit uh, ugly at the position. 245 to 250 hitter probably this year. Eight to 10 home run power but not much more, maybe a little bit of upside if there's some vape pip luck, maybe a little bit of a home run luck, maybe get to a dozen if he uh, happens to close his eyes and swing real hard and make contact on a few more, but uh, not a guy that you want to be, that, that you're going to be super comfortable with on your roster, probably a guy that's going to be on and off your roster as a middle infielder. Jordy Mercer is basically a better version of, of Brandon Crawford. The biggest problem with him, there are some PT con playing time concerns with, uh, Jung Ho Kang in the fold. If Mercer goes into a prolonged slump, you could see Kang out there at shortstop. So the fact that he and Crawford put up similar numbers, Crawford's got more job security. If you're in a deep league where it's going to be tough to replace a Crawford with, with something off the waiver wire, then uh, I would go with Crawford over Mercer. If you're in a shallower league where the uh, replacement level player is a little bit higher, go with Mercer because he is the better player. So and uh, if you're a daily gamer, know that Jordy Mercer is a guy that you're going to want in your lineups against left-handed pitching. He pretty much annihilates them, occasionally moves up in the order. So Jordy Mercer, a little bit better than Brandon Crawford. But if you're in a deeper league, uh, I would feel more comfortable with Crawford because he has nobody pressing him for playing time. 25th is Steven Drew. Uh, decent line drive rate last year, down year with the Yankees. Maybe he reverts back to the player that we saw in Arizona. Not a guy to get terribly excited about. Francisco Lindor is 26th. He's the top prospect in the Cleveland Indians organization. Jose Ramirez is going to start the season at shortstop for the club. There are some experts that are uh, bullish on his potential, mostly because uh, Ramirez can steal some bases. I look at the profile. I'm not so sure that I, I, I trust Ramirez to, to be a fantasy asset, so he does not make, make my top shortstops list this year. I also think that Lindor does eventually – bypass him as a starting shortstop, possibly as early as uh, June. And uh, what, what Lindor brings to the table, uh, if you're in an OBP league, he's a guy that you're going to like a little bit more because he does walk at a fairly good rate, makes contact at a high rate, so he should not be a batting average drag. He should probably hit for a 270-ish average. Uh, I would expect him to hit for a higher average as he gets settled in. If that transition is really quick for him, maybe he hits in the 280s. Uh, can steal some bases, had a little bit of power. Big snack on him is he's going to start the year in the minors, and uh, if Ramirez does get off to a hot start, the Indians are not going to have a lot of incentive to rush uh, Lindor to the big leagues and start that service time clock. So this is a bit of a dicey situation. He's more of a stash candidate in long-term keeper in dynasty leagues or uh, deeper AL-only leagues, maybe some large mixed leagues, but not really a standard league consideration. But when he does get the call, he's a guy that – you're going to want to scoop up to possibly replace some of these guys ranked ahead of them, the Brandon Crawfords, Jordy Mercers of the world. Uh, 27th is Yunel Escobar. Not a very exciting player. Doesn't hit for much power. Doesn't really steal bases. When it's going right, he's making contact at a high rate. You're talking about a guy that might be able to hit in the 270s. Basically, he's not an exciting option, but if you need a middle infielder, that's pretty much what you're picking, picking at, at this point. Uh, it's tough to, to fill the middle infield with, with 
big production. So sometimes you just got to take those reliable at bats, and at least you know Escobar should give you those. Zach Cozart's another guy who should give you reliable plate appearances, but they're just not going to be very good. What you're hoping for with Cozart is that he's able to pop a few home runs because of uh, the Great American Ballpark uh, home run factor. But he's not a guy that's going to hit for average. He's going to hit down orders. You're not getting run production. Not going to steal bases. Uh, this, the, these are the dregs of the position, basically. Nick Franklin is 29th. He's got more upside than uh, basically everybody in front of him up to Andrew to Simmons, with the exception of Lindor. Lindor has a higher ceiling. But um, Nick Franklin struggled last year at the AAA level after being traded from the Mariners to the Rays. Was fairly good there. Uh, was fairly good at the AAA level in the Pacific Coast League, playing for the uh, Mariners affiliate. Hasn't been able to translate his high minor success to the big leagues, but the talent's there. He he could emerge as a decent option at the position, but I, I'm not so sure that he's ready to make that leap just yet. 30th is Didi Gregorius. Plays at Yankee Stadium, so he's got that going for him. Uh, has a favorable ballpark for uh, maybe running into a few home runs. Uh, not a great option at the position. Not going to get a lot of average. Going to get middling power. Not going to steal many bases. Uh, Wilmer Flores, 31st. As I talked about yesterday, uh, my biggest concern with him is his defense, but if the defense reports are, are decent, uh, he should move up the list. He's a fairly good hitter. Uh, his his small sample of big league failure is not enough to scare me off. He did succeed at the high, high minors. He does make a lot of contact. He's a fairly good hitter, so he's a guy that could move up my rankings uh, closer to the season, especially if the Mets aren't able to acquire a uh, shortstop to compete with him at the position. We've got a little bit longer leash there. Um, I'm not that worried about Ruben Tejada. I, I think the Mets at this point, I don't want to say they've moved on, but the fact that they're playing Wilmer Flores uh, non-factor defensively at the position kind of tells you what you need to know. Uh, checking in 32nd is Josh Rut Rutledge. Like I said on the podcast yesterday uh, when discussing second baseman, not a guy I really want to roster outside of Coors Field. He's on here because he should get playing time, but that's about it. Uh, Brad, Brad Miller checks in 33rd. Uh, struggled last year. Not a big fan. He's going to get the starting shortstop position to open the year because our 34th ranked second baseman, Chris Taylor, is injured. When Taylor comes back, I do expect him to press Brad Miller for the shortstop position. He rank, Taylor would rank a little bit higher, probably in front of D.D. Gregorius, uh, possibly in front of uh, Cozart or Yunel Escobar if he was healthy. Problem with Taylor is struck out a lot for a non-power hitter at the big league level last year. Uh, struck out a, at a slightly lower rate in the high minors, but still struck out at a fairly high rate for a non-power hitter, but posted strong walk rates in the minors, so he does have an understanding of the strike zone. Uh, probably a 260 hitter at the big league level. Middling power, should reach double digits stolen bases though, uh, per rated over the course of a full season. So uh, depending on when he gets healthy, He's a guy that could steal double-digit bases, um, and he's a guy that you might want to scoop up to replace some of these bottom barrel middle infielders when uh, he does get healthy. As I said, we're going to get back to Danny Santana, and we are. Uh, he's a guy that I have ranked sixth, as I discussed here. Expert consensus rank is 16th. I get it. I understand why the other experts like him less. There is going to be some vape regression. I mean, he's not going to continue to post a 405 mark, but he did square up the, the ball at a very high rate last year. According to Fangraphs, he had a 26% line drive rate. So you're going to have a sky high bay pick with, with that type of line drive rate. Um, I, I do think that when things normalize, he's probably closer to a 275 hitter than a 300 hitter. But the stolen bases are legit. He swiped 20 and 24 chances last year. Very efficient. Uh, only played in 101 games. So if he gets closer to a full season slate of games, he can even lose some of that efficiency and still steal 30 bases. And I think that that's a reasonable expectation. 275 average was. 25 to 30 stolen bases and maybe a half dozen dingers. That's a nice profile from your shortstop. That definitely plays. That, to me, is a better version of uh, Alexi Ramirez, possibly. So Danny Santana's a shortstop that I like. He's also going to carry uh, outfield eligibility if you're looking for a little bit of roster flexibility, too. So that's nice. Uh, ranked lower than my peers at Fantasy Pros uh, is Elvis Andrews, who I've ranked 13. Uh, the expert consensus rank is 7. I, that I, I, I simply don't understand the infatuation with Andrews. You know you're not going to get much average. You know you're going to get no power. You're putting all of your eggs in the uh, stolen base basket. And as I said, he uh, stole 27 last year, but he's caught 15 times. That is just not an acceptable efficiency rate. 
the 42 stolen bases and, and eight caught stealing in 2013 are nice, but that's that's really the ceiling. And the biggest problem is we don't know what what uh, Jeff Bannister is going to do in terms of of sending his base runners. We knew Ron Washington would send his guys. We knew Andrews would get the green light with him. But if he remains inefficient, what's what's Bannister going to do? Is he going to put the the stoplight on uh, for Andrews? That's that's way too dicey for me. I, I'm going to pass. I don't see him as a top ten shortstop and. He's really a fringe starter at best for me. So I, I have him ranked six spots below my peers, and I'm sticking to my guns. And uh, that's going to do it for the shortstop position today. Thank you for tuning in. We'll pick this up with uh, third base up next. Uh, in the meantime, stop by, the, by fantasybaseballcafe.com and get all your uh, fantasy baseball draft needs.